Good evening, everybody at home, uh, wherever you are watching us. Welcome to um, another event of the series, Making Sense of the Digital Society. My name is Toby Mueller. I am the moderator of this series that um, has been running actually for exactly three years now. We started three years ago and we are planning to continue the series next year with about four dates, I think, and hopefully one of these times with live audiences again. We don't know, nobody does at the moment, but that's what we're hoping for. We've had five events this past year, actually only one with an ample live audience in March with Sibylle Kremer. Some were canceled, of course, in spring and fall, but thank you, the whole team, for mounting this total of five event, which I think is a feat under the circumstances. Thank you, the Federal Agency for Civic Education, the BPB, and of course, the HIC, the HIEG, the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society that curates this event. So for viewers who are with us most of the time or have been with us in the last three years, you know how this is going to roll out, I think. Um, there's going to be the talk of our renowned guest, whom I'm going to introduce to you in a minute. And there's a well, maybe 15 to 20 minute one-on-one -on -one conversation here on stage between the two of us. And then uh, at the latest, it will be your turn, of course, to um, ask your questions. You'll have uh, an advocate. Uh, <laughs> for your questions here in the audience by Christian Graufogel, who is also mounting uh, this series here. And there's a tool for this, a participatory tool called slido.com. I think you see it uh, on your screens. It'll leave for the live audience at Alex TV. Welcome. Uh, and the respective websites of the participating agencies here, the HIC and the BPB. So under pandemic circumstances, as you all know, those events are usually a bit shorter. We don't go on for sometimes up to two hours, I think, in the last uh, three years. So we'll try to be a little shorter uh, today. So this actually should apply to me, too. Now we're in the midst of the subject because, you know, who listens to a moderator anyway? Or for that matter, who trusts a moderator? Because he probably goes on and on, despite of what he just said about being short, time and otherwise. So that is pretty human standard human behavior, right? But what about machines? Do you trust them? How should we make them trustworthy? And what exactly should they be made capable of doing, even held accountable for? We all know examples of machines invading our daily lives, even um, you know, personal chores and even intimate decisions. I'm talking about maps, for example, logistics. I'm talking about trading of stocks, if you happen to trust the stock market, which in itself is actually not even there anymore in most cases and is algorithmically run or governed uh, to some extent at least. I'm also talking about predictive policing or merely predictive algorithms who choose what we watch or listen to or what our children watch or listen to or who we date and who we want to father or mother our children who are then determined by algorithms what they listen uh, and watch to and so on. Or, and this is the key topic I think uh, for our very renowned guest tonight, he surely will be talking about machines driving us around, about AV for autonomous vehicles that run with AI systems with artificial intelligence. How to Trust Machines is the title of his talk tonight. Until June this year, our guest was Associate Professor of Media, Arts and Sciences at MIT, where he co-founded a new field of research altogether, machine behavior. We will hear more about that by himself. One of the key projects that got a lot of global traction, actually, there was the Moral Machine, an online platform that generates ethical dilemma faced by autonomous machines, such as AVs, autonomous vehicles, again. How come we would like others to buy cars that, when challenged to save the passenger or the pedestrian, would save the pedestrian? But we ourselves would prefer the car that saves the passenger. And what role do cultural differences uh, play here? The Moral Machine gathered more than 40 million decisions, 550,000 full surveys. It is a machine, all right, you see, uh, in a minute by the author himself. As of this summer, of all years, our guest is director of the Center for Humans and Machines at the Max Planck Institute for Human Development for Bildungsforschung here in Berlin. So uh, again, there's no live translation tonight because we're trying to keep the numbers of people interacting down here at the venue in 
Sälchen at Holzmarkt uh, in Berlin, but there's going to be a translation available when this event will be made available on our channel at the respective websites and at YouTube. In his own words, actually, of a renowned guest born in Syria, educated in Syria and in the Emirates, in Australia and in the USA, he says, I quote, how can science help us understand, anticipate, and shape major disruptions from artificial intelligence, the web, and social media to the way we think, learn, work, play, and govern? But now he's yours. Very pleased to welcome in the series Iyad Rahwan. Please enter the stage. Thank you so much uh, for this wonderful introduction and thank you all for uh, joining us today. Um, it's an honor to present. Uh, thank you also for the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society for hosting me uh, in this prestigious lecture. Um, as the introduction uh, mentioned, uh, I've moved to Berlin recently um, to start a new center on humans and machines. And uh, by training, I'm a computer scientist, uh, but I'm almost unrecognizably one. So I'm more and more a behavioral scientist. And I work together with uh, people from economics, psychology, uh, political science, anthropology, and so on, to answer some of the uh, questions facing us today. So the backdrop to the talk is this pervasiveness of uh, machines and specifically of artificial intelligence in our lives. So machines today obviously make uh, influence our behavior. They influence the content we consume. So the kind of music we listen to, the books we read, the movies we watch, but also the news we consume and our political opinions. They also help us navigate the world. You know, they give us suggestions for how to uh, get from A to B. Uh, but more and more they're getting used in increasingly sensitive domains. Um, more uh, and more algorithms are being used to decide who gets a job, for example, or to evaluate performance of workers, maybe how, who gets fired. Uh, machines also are deciding who gets a loan or uh, financial opportunities, um, who gets medical uh, support, and what kind of diagnosis you get um, is also becoming increasingly algorithmically mediated. And finally, <coughs> cars will soon drive us around. Uh, in autonomous vehicles, which is a technology that is rapidly uh, advancing. So how do we trust these machines that they will do the right thing, that they will not uh, somehow mistreat us or treat us unfairly, or that we have some kind of um, recourse if something goes wrong? So I would want to split this uh, question into three uh, different questions. <clears throat> and the idea is that before we can trust the machine, we need to answer three fundamental questions. First, we need to understand what can the machine do? So what are they capable of doing? What kinds of mistakes can they make? What kinds of uh, improvements on human judgment can they do? Um, and maybe which areas do we need human oversight? Then we need to answer the question of, well, if, they, if we know what can they do, what ought they do? So what are the... Uh, requirements, legal requirements or design requirements that determine their behavior. What do we want them to do? And finally, the question is, how do we make them do it? So how do we enforce this desire, uh, these constraints, uh, legal constraints and goals on those machines? And these are very difficult questions faced by computer scientists and others uh, these days, and I will only give some partial answers to them. So let's start with what can the machine do? Well, <clears throat> how do you understand what a machine can do? Well, first of all, you could think of computer science as mathematics. This is a famous computer scientist, Edgar uh, Dijkstra, who famously said, uh, computer science is no more about computers than astronomy is about telescopes, which is why he never had a computer, a computer actually himself until very late in life and very reluctantly. Um, he did computer science with a pen and paper or a blackboard because for him, computer science was mathematics. You know, he would just prove that a machine that operates based on this logic will behave uh, this way or that way. And he could prove certain properties uh, of the behavior of the machine. 
And that's a long tradition in computer science. Another perspective is computer, uh, <coughs> computers as, computer science as engineering. So this is a, uh, it's like building a bridge. Uh, engineers build bridges, they build uh, materials, they build uh, buildings, and they test them. Uh, they subject them to different loads, and they improve their designs. And that's kind of an engineering practice. An example is Grace Hopper, who's uh, uh, actually um, a Navy uh, admiral or general, I can't remember her rank, but she was very instrumental in the engineering, in the early days of the engineering of computer systems. And uh, in fact, she was credited often with discovering the first computer bug in, co in, in a machine, which was an actual bug uh, that they had to extract uh, from, from this computer at Harvard University. But finally, there is, well, maybe computer science could also be a science, because after all, the word science is in, in the name. Um, and I would say Herbert Simon is the one uh, who is an economist and a computer scientist and a psychologist who won basically the top award in each of these fields, uh, has advocated this perspective. He wrote a book called The Sciences of the Artificial, in which he contrasted natural science, which is knowledge about natural in, uh, objects and phenomena, like uh, biological phenomena, uh, geological phenomena, and so on, and artificial science, which is knowledge about artificial objects and phenomena, like machines, uh, institutions, and markets. And recently, what we've done, I've brought a a group of uh, scientists from a whole variety of fields um, to, uh, let's say, describe and parameterize this new emerging field of machine behavior. And these are people from computer science, but also, more importantly, from other fields uh, that study behavior, from biology, anthropology, political science, economics, psychology, and so on. And we argued that not only computer science and computer engineers should understand, help us understand how machines behave, but also behavioral scientists. So think of questions like this. Does an algorithm create a filter bubble in which we only hear the information that we already agree with? We could answer this question as engineers. We could look inside the algorithm, or we could answer it as a behavioral scientist by looking at the behavior of the algorithm, as if we look at a person who's serving news to other people, or a newspaper that's writing news articles. Algorithmic justice. Does an algorithm discriminate against a racial group, for example, when they grant parole? Again, you could, do, you could look at it mathematically, but you can also look at it behaviorally. The same way you would look at a human judge today and ask, is this person, is this judge biased or not? Um, and we could move to autonomous vehicles and autonomous weapons and algorithmic trading, algorithmic pricing, uh, you know, the algorithms that determine the price of goods and services online, online dating, conversational robots that may interact with children. You know, what kind of conversations are they having? What kind of influence do these conversations have? You could ask, again, these questions as an engineer, or you could ask them as a psychologist would. So in other words, um, we cannot certify machines as ethical only by looking inside of their code, inside of their heads, no more than we can say that a human is ethical by looking inside their brain. We have been able to uh, hold up humans to ethical standards for thousands of years uh, without understanding the brain, the human brain. Um, and now we're beginning to build machine brains that are beyond our understanding, our complete understanding. So perhaps we should go back to the basics, go back to the behaviorism, um, early days of behaviorism, and say, well, let's think of a machine as, as something like a mouse, uh, something that looks like this, perhaps. And, and we could, of course, inspect this machine directly and ask questions about it by looking inside of its code. But we can also, in the case of a mouse, we could do experiments on the mouse. We could put the mouse in a box, and we could adjust, uh, subject it to stimulus, for example, change the temperature and then measure behavior. For example, how much does it sleep? We could put a mouse in a maze and then look at how, f how fast it can uh, get out of the maze or find the cheese. So we could do something like this with a machine by putting it in a box and treating it as a black box and then asking questions about its behavior. 
So what, if we could do this, then different people would bring in their own algorithms, and we would have benchmarks that we can apply consistently, behavioral benchmarks that we would apply consistently across different algorithms. And well, by doing this, by having this behavioral perspective on machines rather than a purely mathematical and engineering perspective, we can start drawing on lessons from animal behavior. These are the founders of animal behavior who won the Nobel Prize for doing so, and who have basically defined the fundamental foundational questions of all of behavioral science and all of biology. Um, can we do something similar for machines, a whole new science of machine behavior? How this behavior evolves, how it's manifested, how it's triggered, how it changes, and what are its impact on our ecosystem? Um, <clears throat> so this is a call to arms, basically, for uh, trying to understand how can machines uh, uh, what can machines do by taking a behavioral science perspective. Now, the second question is, well, okay, suppose we know what they can do. They can, they can drive, they can drive this way or that way. They have a certain ability to react. Uh, if, if a car, autonomous car drives, it can react faster than a human. This is how fast it can react and so on. Suppose we can characterize its behavior. But sometimes we don't know how it should behave. That's the second fundamental question. So, <clears throat> to make the question more concrete, let's think of a thought experiment. I've learned a German word for, a Gedanken experiment, uh, recently. A thought experiment that goes like this. Uh, we have an uh, autonomous car. Imagine in the future, in the near future, this autonomous car uh, experiences brake failure and is going to run over some pedestrians. But suppose that the car can swerve and hit a pedestrian on the side, on the sidewalk, or on the pavement. This way, it will kill this pedestrian, but it will save more lives. So it will spare three or four or five uh, pedestrians that were in front of it. Should the car do this? And you know, ask yourself if you think the car should swerve. Now, if you follow utilitarian ethics, uh, you would say the car should save the biggest number of lives, and therefore it should swerve. Another scenario, or variant of this scenario, is what if the car could swerve and hit the wall, harming the person in the car? Do you think the car should do the same? Should also swerve? Uh, what we've done is we've run uh, this as a survey, and we found that the majority of people agree on what the car should do. Most people think the car should minimize the loss of life. It should do whatever action it, ne it takes or it is needed to minimize uh, harm. And this should hold even if the person being harmed or sacrificed is the person in the car. But then we ask people, which car would you buy? And this is where we discovered the social dilemma. People said, well, absolutely not that car. I would never buy the car that will self-sacrifice me. But I want everybody else to buy such cars. So there is this uh, basically question turned from an ethical question, an ethical dilemma about what is the right thing to do to a social dilemma, which is, well, we all agree what the right thing to do is, but we can't enforce it. We can't have consumers opt into this agreement, this outcome. So it's a different kind of question. It's a question of human cooperation, of us trusting each other that we have to enforce these kinds of rules in this rare, uh, potentially very rare uh, accident scenario. So. We wanted to get more beyond this. We wanted to engage more people with this discussion. We also wanted to um, uh, make the scenario more complex because we wanted to know if other factors also matter in people's perception. So we built a website called The Moral Machine, which you can visit uh, yourselves and, uh, and play this game, which I think is very instructive and it's becoming now even part of high school textbooks in, in some countries. It's a moral machine experiment uh, takes you through randomly generated uh, dilemmas that look like this. So here's one example. There is an autonomous car that's going to uh, run over three adults and a dog, but the car can swerve, and if it does so, it will hit a barrier and it will kill the person in the car. 
Now notice that the people uh, who are crossing the street are crossing illegally. Um, now this may or may not be taken into account. Also notice that there is a different gender composition. There's two women and one man, and so on. Now, to our um, delight and surprise, this website went viral. Um, it was in part thanks to coverage by the traditional news media, but also a lot of YouTubers uh, who are um, uh, these people who film themselves while playing a game, and millions of people watch them while they're doing that. It's a strange phenomenon, uh, but it's something that, has, uh, that I've discovered in the context of this project. And uh, at the time of analysis, we had uh, translated the website to 10 languages. We have 4 million users answer 40 million dilemmas. And uh, half a million, filled half a million uh, demographic surveys. And this is, the, this is the snapshot that I will talk about, but the website has continued to run and the number has now reached about 10 million users who answered 10 million decisions. We uh, published this work uh, in 2018 as a collaboration with uh, scientists from ver various fields. And you could see here the distribution of the data set. So we have basically what appears to be one of the largest psychological surveys ever conducted. Um, we got people from virtually every country in the world, um, in, in some cases millions of people per country. Um, now I want to show you what the results look like. So this figure, this picture shows you what happens if I take a scenario and I replace the thing on the left with the thing on the right. So if I take a scenario, any scenario, that has a dog or a, or a cat and I, that is going to die, and I switch the dog to a human being, what is the increase, increased probability that this will survive, this human will survive, compared to the dog? And as you can see, 60%. So it pays to be a human. Uh, at least in the opinion of, uh, of the survey participants. The second thing that matters a lot is saving more lives. So people strongly prefer to save a greater number of lives, like one more life or two more lives or three more lives and so on. And the third big one is people want to save young lives. So they want to save babies and children over older people. And these are the three big ones. Then you have some kind of controversial ones, uh, or maybe not so controversial ones. So for instance, we find people um, prefer to save, to save individuals who cross legally, who didn't do anything wrong, versus people who cross illegally. And that's a more than 30% chance of, of survival, an in, in increased chance of survival. But also, people also, to the same extent, prefer to save a business person over a homeless person. Now, this, of course, doesn't mean that we should program cars to do this. In fact, uh, this is a case where uh, government regulation is a clearly important uh, player to enforce fundamental rights, despite the fact that public opinion from surveys may prefer otherwise. We also uncovered, because we had such a large data set, we were able to uncover uh, cross-cultural differences, and this was like, for us, one of the most fascinating parts, aspects of this data. I want to show you here this, these preferences which are mapped on a, uh, on a circle. So you can see here that the thing that matters most is sparing humans, because that's the highest. Now I want to show you where Germany falls compared with the global average. So as you can see here, Germans, for example, uh, prefer not to intervene. You know, they prefer inaction more than the global average. So kind of more reserved. They also prefer to save humans to a greater extent than, than people in uh, the rest of the world. So sparing humans is very important. They prefer to spare people with higher status, but to a lesser extent than the rest of the world. And this makes sense to me because Germany is, uh, seems to be an egalitarian society to a large extent. And I want to show you now what China looks like, for example, in contrast. And you could do this for uh, any pair of countries, this kind of comparisons on the website. And you could see that China 
has some similar characteristics to Germany in some areas. But surprisingly, for example, uh, sparing the lawful, the people who are crossing legally, matters even more in China compared to, uh, to Germany, for example. But sparing younger people matters a lot less. The Chinese still prefer to spare younger people, but to a lesser extent than people in the West in general. And you know, there are, we were exploring various cultural uh, variables that may explain this. And one of them is this collectivism and individualism. So collectivist cultures in which the individual is only part of a community or a tribe or a group seem to, be, to, to have a, a weaker preference to save younger people. So the question is, should these cultural differences be taken into account in programming autonomous cars? And you know, obviously, that's a, that's a broad question for society that we highlight here. So that's what we've, I've spoken about what can machines do, what ought the machines do. Uh, and finally, the question that remains is, well, how can we make them do it? So suppose we can reach an agreement on what are the standards, what are the ethics that autonomous cars should have then how do we make sure that they are enforced? Uh, I very much like this picture of, of the regulation of human behavior. So this is uh, uh, from a book uh, by Larry Lessig, who's a constitutional law scholar, professor at Harvard University. He wrote this book called, uh, more than 20 years ago called Code and Other Laws of Cyberspace. And he said, the human behavior is restricted or constrained or regulated by four forces. The first is law. When it's illegal, you go to jail if you don't do it or you, get, you pay a fine. But all, we're also constrained by market con conditions and market forces. We are constrained by the architecture of the environment in which we are surrounded. And we're also constrained by norms, what other people expect of us. And I think if you replace the human with a machine, like an autonomous car, or any robot for, for that matter, then we need to think of all four forces uh, of law, market, architecture, and norms. The typical approach for thinking about how to exercise oversight over a machine is called human in the loop. So we have a machine like a car driving or a a, a, an algorithm advising on who should go to jail and who should get parole and so on. Um, as long as we put a human in the loop, then everything goes well. You know, it's like uh, we have an autopilot in the airplane, but we have a human pilot in the cockpit as well. And this approach works or can work sometimes if we all agree on the same goal. So in this, as you can see in this picture, everybody wants the same thing. And the job of the human is to exercise over, oversight over the machine in order to make sure that this thing that everybody agrees on is implemented by the machine. But what we're noticing in these examples that I've just given and many others is that people often want different things. Uh, maybe because of the cultural background they come from, maybe because of the ethical framework that they're using. Some people care more about fairness, other people care more about efficiency, other people care more about safety, and so on. So then, it is really our problem to agree, to make up our minds about what the machine should do before we even begin having oversight. In other words, what we need is to move from having a human in the loop to having society in the loop, which I define as human in the loop plus a social contract that defines our mutual agreement about what these machines uh, should do and how they should behave. So to close, I want to give an example. Obviously, we have this uh, case of autonomous vehicles, um, which is unsolvable in any kind of fundamental absolute way, but we could still solve it by agree reaching agreement over how to resolve the conflicts involved in this dilemma. Let me give you another example that is an old example that looks very similar. Um, these, uh, you, there are these uh, bars, metal bars, that you can install in front of the vehicle. Like any car can have them. Uh, they're called moose bars in Canada. They're called kangaroo bars or roo bars in Australia. They're called bull bars 
in, in America. So basically, the, the name changes based on whatever animal you are likely to hit. Um, and they're essentially, the, one of their main functions is to protect you from hitting the animal, you know, for, protect the passengers in case you hit the animal. But uh, studies have found in the 90s that they also hit, hurt people in other cars and pedestrians to a greater extent. And this is the reason why they got banned in Australia, they got banned in the UK, they got banned in many parts of Europe, but they did not get banned in the US, as far as I could tell, uh, at least until now, as far as I remember. So here's a question where there are, there's a conflict between the safety of the passenger, the safety of the pedestrians and people in other cars. It's caused by a physical feature of the car. Different cultures, well, first of all, there were studies, behavioral studies, that determined that these kinds of cars cause different damage, different distribution of harm, lower harm for the people in the car, more harm for the people on the street. And some cultures have decided to ban them as a result, while others didn't, because they value the trade-off differently. This is something we've seen before, right? So with autonomous vehicles, the difference is that there is no shiny bar. There's nothing physical that you can see and, and that can tell you that this is the cause of this outcome. Instead, there, is a, there are algorithms inside the brain of the car that are shifting the distribution of risk uh, to different road users, which means that we have to be extra careful and we have to really look carefully at the behavior of the car before we determine how the car should behave and therefore before we can trust it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Iyad, for this uh, very concise and very concrete uh, talk about uh, machine behavior. Let's explore a little more in the coming maybe 15 minutes before we start taking questions from our live audience. Please do so under slido.com. I think, again, you see it uh, on your screens where you can participate in this discussion um, in a minute. So, Iyad, your talk was, um, you know, so fraught with examples and everything, and I'm starting with a rather abstract question to dive into our discussion um, here now. Now, um, starting with human behavior, actually, before we delve into machine behavior a little more, why is it a lot of us, I think I can safely say that a lot of us worry more about accidents uh, of autonomous vehicles, like this, there was the Uber accident that got a, you know, a lot of traction, many people talked about and so forth, um, and the like, uh, although we know that... Um, we have about, what, 1.2 million traffic fatalities worldwide per year, and we're going to have, or we could have, a lot less by autonomous vehicles. Uh, I think you projected about 90% less traffic fatalities a year, so that's a huge um, amount, that's a huge number that would go down in traffic fatalities. And still, uh, trust, actually human trust, in machine behavior is pretty low at that moment. That means we would favor a lot more um, injuries, fatalities um, with the current model and not take into account what we would save. How come? Well, I think uh, th there's a lot, many different possible reasons for this. I think uh, one of them is that uh, people are fascinated by this new technology. So all eyes are on the companies that are building autonomous cars like Uber or Google or Tesla. So every accident gets so much coverage and a lot of media attention because of just the fascination with this new thing. Um, but, you know, so, so I think part of it is irrational uh, because we're over weighing the, the gravity of these kinds of accidents because, you know, on that very day, many humans died from human-caused accidents uh, elsewhere and they were not covered uh, unless it's like a bus full of, full of children. We don't really cover um, uh, traffic accidents uh, unless something is really extreme. Um, but does this mean that we are completely irrational? I don't think so. And I think it's because we don't have yet enough data points to establish trust. You know, these cars are now designed, they're either being used in testing mode, which is a very controlled mode, 
Um, they are being driven during the day with like, you know, sometimes at night, of course, but like there's full visibility, no, no snow, no fog. Um, and, you know, and it could be like a limited uh, scenarios, for example, only on highways. So we still haven't seen enough. You know, it's like a new animal on the road, you know, uh, that, that has a behavior that we, we don't really fully understand yet. We're being told that 90% of accidents will eventually disappear because they're caused by human error, but we don't really have enough data to establish that claim with full confidence uh, because autonomous cars have not been tested in all representative driving scenarios. So I think until we, th this happens, people are not so irrational to be afraid and worried. Having said that, I think there is human irrationality that will also play a role, and we're, we're studying some of this uh, ourselves in work that's still ongoing. But you know, think of how humans mostly rate themselves as better than average drivers. So the majority of, this is a well-known- uh, Especially men. Exactly, so, so we all, you know, we have this kind of overconfidence in our ability to drive. Um, and this is just not, not just driving, but in all sorts of things, people often on average rate themselves higher than average, which doesn't make any sense, which means that there is some kind of overconfidence. And this could shape the way that we trust uh, autonomous vehicles, because we, even if they're uh, as safe as, as half of the people, we think we're, we're in the you know, top 10%. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't trust them. So unless they improve in one shot, or, you know, they become almost 99% or 100% safe, uh, a lot of people won't trust them. And this is something we have to worry about. And I think this kind of human, um, potential human irrationality around these new technologies is something we have to take into account in order to save more lives because we want people to trust them at the exact right moment where it's rational to do so. Not too early and not too late because too early or too late will lead to more greater loss of lives. So if people adopt the technology too soon and it's not re really trustworthy, more people will die. If they adopt it too late, more people will die because we, humans will continue to drive and hitting each other on the road. So you actually understand some of the irrationality involved at the moment when it comes to trust um, into machine behavior. Now, do you think that, uh, you know, let's say an excessive or really fast increase of scientific data would really change that? Because I'm thinking of another number that, of course, um, is occupying our minds all the time this year, and this is the number of COVID-related deaths uh, worldwide that I think at the moment is about 1.65 million uh, people, and I'm not sure if the vaccines or more scientific data would actually change uh, how people feel uh, uh, about the virus, especially in Germany, where we have a lot of demonstrations of people saying it doesn't even exist. So many scientists actually at this front are sort of desperate and saying, what are we, what are we going to do? I mean, we got the more data and we still cannot convince a growing uh, a number of people um, living here actually. So do you think it's going to be different with uh, machine behavior and our trust? No, I don't think so. I think actually it's a really great analogy that you mentioned because you know I, I should say first of all that I'm not an expert on <clears throat> epidemiology or COVID and, and uh, you know I'm only observing as a, as a generic oh. sci general scientist. Uh, rather than a, an expert. But I think the, the COVID situation has highlighted to us the limits of science. Mm -hmm. It's really hard to know how many deaths precisely are caused by COVID because there are comorbidities, for example, that you know, somebody may have COVID but also die from another, reason, uh, another cause. Um, there's lots of uncertainty about how the virus spreads, about how the, the vaccines work about human behavior and our social contact patterns. So there's just so much uncertainty and there's, there's a lot of science being done that then turns out to be not as reliable as you were hoping. And this goes both in the fear mongering and in the kind of uh, optimistic directions. And it just shows you it's really hard to establish causal relationships in this domain. And I think the same thing could hold for autonomous vehicles. Like let's suppose that um, autonomous vehicles exist on the market and then uh, all numbers of fatalities go down except for bicyclists, for instance. Maybe they stay the same. They don't get worse. Is it because the car companies are dis 
kind of deliberately not caring about cyclists, or is it because the cyclist's behavior is somehow causing this? And it's not an easy question to answer scientifically. You have to run experiments, you have to randomize, and <clears throat> we need to build infrastructure that enables this kind of investigations into machine behavior. You know, with human uh, behavior, you could say, you know, I'm going to give some people a medicine and other people a placebo, and they don't know which is which, and this is how I know exactly if the medicine works. Or I'm going to, you know, uh, give some people uh, this kind of loan, other people different loans, and I see which villages do better, you know, in, in the long run, and so on. And I think we need similar kind of experimental paradigm for, for large-scale machine behavior. But now, when the different companies are just developing their algorithms for profit, they have no incentive to be part of these kind of studies. You know, for their cars have to be optimized for, for whatever metrics they have. We don't have the standard metrics yet, and so on. So I think we we'll still need a lot of um, groundwork before we can actually answer causal, with causal certainty questions about machine behavior. Yes, that's interesting because uh, I think certainty and uncertainty have uh, um, been highlighted very much in this year, actually. And if this pandemic achieved one thing, and then it's maybe to highlight the central role of doubt in uh, scientific research that uh, many people probably forgot about who are not involved uh, in research. So let's hope that this uh, uh, you know, central aspect of doubt sort of persists uh, in people's minds, that this is just uh, the way uh, scientific research is done. Let's talk a little bit about cultural differences uh, that I think was uh, very interesting in, in your talk. Uh, we know from the massive data you gathered uh, with the moral machine. You know, some, as you said, cultures value the elderly higher than others. Um, some are more centered around the collective rather than the individual. Many Westerners probably will probably save children first. That's not the case in China, uh, as you showed us, and so forth. Now there's, I think, various problems that uh, are connected uh, with those kind of questions or with the data, and I'm, I'm wondering how you dealt with them uh, in your research in a little bit more detail. Like, uh, one would be who determines what the dominant choices of a culture actually are. I mean, once this technology is implemented into those cars, I mean, who decides there? Because there's minorities in every culture. There's, you know, uh, contesting values, uh, uh, at least in more or less free societies that always fight with each other, and it's very hard to define what a dominant culture actually is. It's something we talk about a lot in Germany, uh, or have been talking about more and more uh, in the last years, I think. So how to define that, actually? What is dominant about a culture, and then actually built it into the technology? Um, I think we have to be really careful about uh, separating the uh, positive versus the uh, normative, mm -hmm. or let's call it the empirical versus the normative. Mm -hmm. So our, the, the purpose of our survey has been to establish uh, the empirical facts. Mm -hmm. What do people th who visit the website think the cars should do? Now, there is a separate normative question, which is what should be uh, done by the uh, car makers, the, car, the, the companies that are manufacturing the cars, what should be done by the lawmakers who are setting the rules for the behavior of these cars. And those are questions that are not answered by scientists. They are answered by uh, legal scholars and policy makers. And they may or may not take into account public opinion. And in some cases, they should perhaps overrule public opinion. For example, if the public thinks that a certain minority should not be prioritized in autonomous vehicle accidents, but that contradicts with the constitution of the country or the fundamental rights of citizens, then obviously that should uh, uh, take precedence. There are cases, however, where knowing what the public um, uh, prefers is helpful because it might give you a sense of something you've missed. For example, the, uh, there was a, uh, a, in Germany, a commission created by the Ministry of Transportation uh, to basically put some guidelines, create some ethical guidelines for autonomous cars. And one of the things they said is don't discriminate, the car should not discriminate in, in risk between different people based on their age or gender or anything, any kind of mental constitution. But now the word age seems to uh, be at odds with a strong preference for saving children. 
And you might wonder, well, why did they miss this fact? You know, they, they said, so perhaps, you know, a, a 20-year-old versus a 50-year-old should be treated the same, but should a five-year-old be treated the same? You know, and maybe this is a place where public opinion can push back a little bit. And it's a conversation, you know, it's just like politics. Mm -hmm. And what we're doing is, is equivalent to an opinion poll about a future technology uh, that doesn't exist yet. And I think once we can separate the opinion poll facts from the normative question, we can say, okay, in, in some domains we allow it to, to influence a policy in other areas we don't allow to to influence policy policy overrides and so on so i think it's only one part of the big puzzle of how you regulate these technologies i am aware we are leaping into the normative here and that's uh, something scientists don't like to do so thank you for bearing with me uh let's just like to make another thought experiment as you called gedanken experiment uh, tatsächlich um just to see how this is play out let's say if i as a typical white male middle class western european would travel to syria your home country. I hope this will become possible soon enough in my lifetime. Whose default is going to run the car? Is it going to be my default that is culturally probably different from most Syrians uh, would determine to be in an experiment like this, whatever the government uh, uh, will play out, whatever policy is going to be. And you know, we talked about this before, that uh, Syria, of course, also is a country with very diverse backgrounds, uh, with many minorities, depending on the region uh, we're talking about. So he's, whose default is going to be a car? Am, am I going to have a device with me that is going to build into the autonomous vehicle that is going to serve my default, uh, or is it going to be another kind of default? I mean, it's, uh, it's certainly a worthwhile question and an important question to ask. I would say that I'm, I don't feel qualified to answer it mm -hmm. because I'm not a a trained in yeah. policy yeah. or in law, uh, but as a, I could answer you as a layperson mm -hmm. would. Uh, mm -hmm. And I could say that you know, we already have um, universal traffic laws. Univers for example, we have universal traffic signs. Mm -hmm. you know, everywhere in the world, green means go and red means stop. Mm -hmm. Everywhere, uh, you know, the stop sign looks the same. But there are also differences. You know, how do you behave at an intersection? Who has priority at different kinds of um, overtaking or certain kinds of turns? Differ different speed limits apply in different countries. Um, or, for example, in school zones and so on. So we already have an example uh, within transportation where we have universal laws, but also some local variations. And perhaps something like this would apply, mm -hmm. where uh, some kind of universal agreement about how cars should distribute risk would be agreed upon using some, you know, some kind of global standard. Plus, perhaps different cultures could then tweak uh, those uh, priorities. Now, to what extent they should do it regionally versus you know, uh, countrywide and so on, this becomes, you know, question of politics, who has jurisdiction, who can, you know, I mean, there are, uh, in the United States, for example, different states have diff slightly different rules, yeah. uh, and so on. So it really becomes very quickly a question of politics, and I think that's important to recognize that the behavior of machines is a new uh, political arena, mm -hmm. because people are going to begin to fight over how the machines should behave. And the case of a car is maybe trivial. You know, we want the cars to be safer. It's kind of easy to agree on, on the general parameters. But when algorithms make decisions about uh, l criminal justice or decisions about uh, how you allocate resources to uh, poor people who are struggling and what kind of safety net you know, ru rules and regulations do you have, um, in the future, I predict, instead of fighting over who to put in the, in the Senate or in the Parliament, we're going to fight over which algorithm is going to be responsible for running different functions in government. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a scary thing. You know, we, do, we have, do we have a mechanism? Do we have the institutions to support this? Uh, I think it's still an open question. That is the question um, of the status of a machine, actually, altogether. And maybe the question is, is there a difference between ethics and AI ethics? Something we 
talked before actually uh, in this series and you probably remember in Europe we have had this debate not just in Europe but it was very prominent here because the EU, EU European Union was thinking of uh, um, allocating personhood to robots about three or four years ago that started uh, it took the first hurdles but then it got stuck at the process uh, I believe I've have haven't read much about that uh, in the last two years. So you're talking about, you know, like invasive robots in, in, in surgery and uh, things like that. Should they be held uh, accountable, uh, actually, for what they do in case uh, they make a mistake uh, and so forth? Why was that, we could say that today, probably an erring path that only a couple of years later seems to be from a distant era? Uh, Almost is it because uh, anthropomorphism mapping, you know, human characteristic onto technology just doesn't work, or what happened there actually? Well, I think uh, that's an interesting question. We there is evidence that when uh, there are machines involved in making a decision and errors are made, and then people try to find the closest human and they point the finger at the human. Mm -hmm and they avoid pointing the finger at the machine. And, you know, we, in our own findings, uh, we, we see this, and sometimes it's, it's good because, you know, you want, you, machines don't care if you punish them, you need to punish the human who built the machine. But sometimes people point to the wrong human. For example, we found that when a machine, when an autonomous, a semi-autonomous car makes an error and kills somebody, people want to blame the human in the car for not overriding the machine. And if the car doesn't, but if it's flipped, you know, if the car, human is driving and the machine is overriding, people still blame the human. They don't blame the car for not overriding. So they always seem to go for the human in the car rather than the person who built the machine. And I think that's, so those kinds of problems result from how our psychology is projected, you know, how we're projecting personhood or intentionality or whatever mental state to these machines. And I think it could backfire or misfire, and then we may fail to hold the right party accountable. And I think that's the reason why we have to be careful. Having said that, you know, like uh, some people talk about robot rights and so on, and you know, I'm not really part of this debate, but I do think that we should use whatever institutional means necessary to implement human ethics, human, the human will um, in the world. And you know, if treating a machine like a corporation, which ultimately is owned by a human, if, if that's a way of making the laws work and give, get the result that we want, that's fine. But if it's not, then, then we should find another way. So I feel like ultimately, the ultimate objective is human uh, thriving and human safety and you know, us doing better in the world, being, feeling safer, getting be better medical hair, uh, care, uh, getting um, moved from A to B with a lower risk, you know, of being in an accident and so on. And everything else is is kind of a political process to reach that goal. Okay, so really quick before we take the questions, can I say that um, aside from the political level, from regulatory frameworks, there is no AI ethics, there's just ethics. Exactly. I think there's, there's only human ethics. Um, Applied to AI, you know, AI may raise new questions that um, we, new kinds of ethical questions, but they're ultimately human ethical questions. Like, uh, what to do, how should a car behave one second before it hits someone? That's not a question that we were able to even consider because it's an absurd question. You know, within a second, no human can, reply, can respond uh, quick enough. But maybe an AI can, can react quick enough. So we have kind of a new ethical domains that mm -hmm. are uh, th that we're entering, mm -hmm. but ultimately we have to apply the same values mm -hmm. that we care about. Um, it's more like an, we have superpowers, you know, ethical superpowers now. Mm -hmm. We could have the machine behave as a human would or randomly, or we could do something else, and that's a new opportunity for us to do better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, Christian Graufogel. Let's see what happens on Slido. Do you have any questions? Yes, we have quite a lot of questions uh, on Slido from the community. Um, most of them are about their thought experiment with an autonomous car. Uh, so the first question um, asks, would we really trust machines more if they decided differently as we would? Wouldn't it be more trustworthy if my car behaved in my interest and therefore like me? Um, 
Yes, so it would be more trustworthy for you in one situation to, uh, for the car to behave in your own self-interest. But I think, uh, and now I'm moving to the normative, okay? <laughs> so, Thank you. <laughs> so, so your self-interest is, is, is a broader question. It's not just what's your, what's your interest in that particular moment when you're in the car. Uh, there is this idea from uh, uh, philosopher John Rawls called the veil of ignorance, which is imagine that you are in a position where you look at two different societies or multiple different societies, and you don't know who you're going to be. You might be the person in the car, or you might be the person on crossing the street, or you might be the person in the other car. Which society do you want to be when you don't know which situation you're going to be? And I would argue that, you know, I would guess that it is, you would think, I would think it's in my best interest to live in a society where the car will minimize harm because by chance, if I'm one of 10 people involved in the accident, I will be more likely to survive if the car minimizes harm, full stop. So, so it's, but that's a, that's a social contract that I'm willing to enter into because that, I think it's in my best interest as well as in the interest of society. So I think it's rational to enter into the social contract. And I think, I think that's the case. But I think if we think about only a very uh, localized situation, then a different logic uh, comes about. That probably depends if you believe in Ayn Rand or Immanuel Kant, right? There might be different <laughs> frameworks uh, at play there. And, yeah, of course, we could disagree as well, of course. <laughs> Re and be both reasonable. Um, then there's another question uh, which touches upon the point of the cultural specific aspect which uh, Toby Miller already referred to. Um, what could be the risk of country or culture specific software to be adapted on, in autonomous vehicles based on what you presented? And another question touches upon the historic context and asks what, what role does historic context play in your model? Values derived from historical experience and they change over time. Ethical updates for old cars by TÜV? Yeah, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll try and answer the question. It's a complex uh, uh, question. I think um, culture obviously changes. You know, our uh, uh, ethical values and what we consider offensive today is very different from like 50 years or 100 years ago. Uh, you know, rights are different and hopefully, you know, on average we are progressing. Um, but I think this is definitely we sh something we should take, uh, take into account as we think about machines. Even our perception of the machines also changes over time because they are changing. You know, the machines are becoming better able at explaining themselves, explaining their decisions. Um, maybe they just become better at their job. You know, they, get, they drive better, they make uh, more reliable decisions. Um, so we, we, develop, we will develop greater trust in them, hopefully, over time. Um, so I think this is why we shouldn't just pre-program the, uh, the, the autonomous cars once and just forget about it. I think we need to revisit because the machines are changing and we are changing. And uh, we need to constantly, as a society, I think, reflect on our own values and therefore the values that we want to uh, implement in these decision-making algorithms. Um, then there's a question about uh, biased. Um, uh, it goes like this. How do you prevent automated cars from making flawed decisions, e.g. the crash test bias puts female drivers in danger? Uh, because the standard dummy is male uh, or not pregnant. Yeah, well, I think um, clearly there's there's um, many, many opportunities for us now to revisit how everything is designed, uh, how our technology is designed, how the world is designed, and whether it's inclusive, and whether it gives um, uh, due uh, protection and opportunities to, diff to, to underrepresented groups and, and minorities and so on. Uh, and it's something that people in AI are working on, you know, very hard. So I think, you know, there's a whole conference dedicated to fairness, accountability, and transparency in artificial intelligence with, you know, hundreds of papers uh, being published. Um, so it's certainly high on the agenda. Um, and it's something that uh, we should take into account. Now, you know, in, in our survey, I would, what we find is the public actually want the car to favor women. Uh, so there's, slightly, there's a slightly, uh, slight preference for, for vehicles to save women. 
uh, especially pregnant women, but just women in general. Um, and this, this is a question for society, like what, what is the right answer? I, I have no idea, you know, I'm just a scientist describing uh, the numbers and presenting the mirror, you know, to society so that society can have a chance to reflect on itself. You know, is this, is this what we want or, or is this something that we want to negotiate? Uh, but I think obviously we, we want to aspire and I think computer, computer scientists and people who are building technology are increasingly aware and there's a very strong movement within within the AI community to uh, address these kinds of issues. And it's not easy, uh, but, but it's a constant dialogue and it's, it's receiving a lot of attention. I think most of these uh, questions actually center about something that we've seen before in history. And uh, you describe in another article I read of yours, and this is uh, just a question of the social contract. What does the social contract consist of? The Leviathan, so to speak, uh, so to speak, of the power of the many that uh, in the Western world has, um, you know, led to a lot of bloodshed, uh, really violent wars of uh, um, sort of negotiating this social contract over the last three, four hundred years, um, so to speak. And now there's this techno Leviathan sort of standing in the front of our house. A new social contract you try to bring into the equation, right? Where you say it's not just about the individual. We have to have a new social contract, which would be called something like the techno Leviathan. Now, is this going to lead to another era of you know, heavy unrests, uh, bloody wars, violent negotiations like we've witnessed in the last 200 years. I mean, it's, uh, n n now again, I'll have to talk about, uh, about this as a kind of a hobbyist philosopher historian rather than an expert. But if you think of the idea of the social contract um, and specifically the idea of the Leviathan, you know, this kind of very powerful sovereign who's uh, authority emanates from the people, it was actually presented as a solution to violence, right? So, mm -hmm. and it depends on where you stand on this. You know, uh, the, the Ho Thomas Hobbes, who's a philosopher who, who wrote the book Leviathan uh, and kind of put the foundation of the social contract uh, theory is uh, lived through the, the civil war in, in, uh, in England, and which was a terrible time. And he saw this uh, sovereign as a solution to the problem of violence, that you know, the, the, there has to be a monopoly on violence given to this one entity that we trust, because we, we, and we trust it because we mutually agreed to create it. Um, and then of course that entity could also become corrupt itself and, and cause violence, which is why we had to revise, kind of reprogram the Leviathan, if you like, um, in order to limit its, its powers and hold it accountable and create separations of powers and all of that. And the question now is, uh, you know, with AI, you could see it, it could be a threat, or, but it could also be an opportunity. So mm -hmm. it, there could be a threat in the sense that um, if the world becomes run by algorithms and the algorithms are biased and they favor certain groups and they perpetuate uh, inequalities and they make the powerful even more powerful, they could become a tool of oppression. What most of the comments just feared, we've heard now, right? With some mm -hmm. of these comments. Mm -hmm. Or um, algorithms could be kind of a salvation for us because they, mm -hmm. they cannot be bribed. They don't care about being bribed. Maybe, and, and when they make mistakes, you can open them and reprogram them. Where, whereas humans, maybe we have our own prejudices that are much more difficult to, pro to reprogram. So, uh, you know, a friend of mine, Sandhil Molinathan, who's a professor at the University of Chicago, has been doing work on uh, algorithmic discrimination in healthcare, for example, in the US. And he wrote this New York Times article uh, saying, you know, algorithms can be uh, corrupt, but they're easier to fix than corrupt people. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, you can open the hood and, and, and change the code. And I think that's, in that sense, there is an opportunity. And you know, what will determine whether this will be like our salvation or our demise is really a question of, the, of politics. You know, what, how, do we, how do we take care of this? It's not process. that easy to open the hood, though. We're going to talk uh, about this at the very end of discussion, how to open the hood in Europe, uh, at least. Uh, there's uh, quite something at stake uh, in these days, actually, that's being presented. But maybe uh, call for a last round of uh, questions and comments from Slido, Christian. What do you think?
Yes. Um, there is another question which actually touches upon the point of the social contract. Um, asks, how can we find a real fair compromise when decisions are actually made by tech companies and programmers? Who determines regulations if not all users are involved? It's a very good question. You know, how do you how do you do this uh, outside of of uh, information technology too? I mean, it's a problem we faced before um, in many domains. So I think one of the problems we have today is yeah, a lot of AI algorithms that influence our lives are run by corporations, and there is little regulation of the behavior of these corporations. And even the regulations we have now are still far behind. I think what the technology is capable of. Um, the problem is, if we if we start regulating them heavily, that could also be problematic because the regulation is often too slow to change. They're also influenced by politics, um, and they could get us stuck. You know, they could stifle innovation as well. So there may be a sweet spot, and and I think this kind of behavioral approach may be may be a good part of the solution at least because. You know, we could say, look, we, we want algorithms not to do this. We're not going to tell you how to program them exactly. We're not going to mandate the computer code, but we're going to mandate the behavioral expectations. It's like, you know, with, with humans as well. You know, we, we just say, look, we don't know how you drive. Just don't, don't break the traffic rules. You know, beyond that, you could drive in your own style, right? You have some freedom, some leeway. So I think... We, we need uh, more tech-savvy politicians who are able to understand this uh, nuance and who are able to work with the, tech, with the technology companies to kind of negotiate a, these boundaries and, and maybe shift them over time. You know, by, by, uh, as you build more and more trust with companies, then you give them maybe a little bit more freedom um, to try things out and so on. But yeah, I don't, I don't have an answer. I don't think we have a, it's a very, very, it's probably the most important question of politics in the age of AI. Um, so I don't claim to have an answer to it, but I, I think I can help ask the question. Uh, there's one last question. Um, well, there are a lot of others, but maybe uh, this is the last for tonight. Um, other than the example with uh, autonomous cars, what other ethical and social dilemmas do you foresee with AI applications across other economic sectors? Maybe that's quite a big question for the for the last round, but maybe you can just touch upon a few. I mean, um, there's already we're already seeing um, AI being used to uh, decide which workers get allocated the jobs. You know, like in the gig economy, uh, things like Uber and you know delivery services and so on. Um, algorithms are optimizing for uh, the profit of the company that's operating the service, for example, Uber or Lyft or whatever. But this may result in uh, unequal treatment of different uh, drivers, for instance. Uh, some people who just you know, don't get as many jobs or for some other reason you know, don't get the service because you know, they live too far and it's not worth uh, sending somebody there. So you don't get availability. This thing is now completely reg you know, self-regulated by the companies. There's no um, uh, legal expectation or kind of even quality standards that are applied. But then you know, criminal justice is another one. In the US, there are algorithms today that advise the judge, should I send this person on bail or should they wait in jail f until their trial? And the, al you know, the judges are, f in many cases, following the algorithm's advice. And in, many in some cases, maybe they blame it on the algorithm if the algorithm gets it wrong. And that's, you know, that, this is a, a serious question related to the freedom uh, of individuals you know, and the treatment of, of citizens in, in, in a very sensitive context. Healthcare is another one. You know, there's a study by Sandhill that I mentioned earlier um, that determines which uh, people would get uh, medical treatment would be uh, like flagged for extra medical treatment in the US. And you know, their investigation revealed that the algorithms were dis unintentionally discriminating against black people. Uh, so you know, they, these are just a few examples. So you could imagine how sensitive it can be if we all of a sudden we discover certain groups have just been dying more because of an algorithm. 
algorithmic mistake or algorithmic sort of profit uh, in motive. So everything, basically, any, anything that can be where a decision has to be made about something that you care about, this decision could be made by an AI sometime in the future. And in many cases, it's already being ha happening. Thank you, Christian, for being the advocate for those questions. I'm aware that there are many more tonight. I'm not surprised at all, actually, with this topic and with this uh, talk you gave. Yet, very really hit a spot that is uh, going to stay with us uh, for quite some time, um, I believe. At the end of this discussion, I'd like to discuss uh, not so much the future or the normative future, but actually the present uh, of policy. Um, that applies to your field of research, too, especially. You wrote about that, too. You know, uh, the study of machine behavior may result in breach of terms of services, uh, sometimes with big platforms setting up fake accounts or personas. A young research team just experienced that with Spotify uh, in Sweden and got into some trouble, uh, at least, because it did just that. Um, the question is how to regulate that. And there are certain um, things being put forward right now, actually, as of this day or yesterday, on the European level by the European Commission. Of course, I'm talking about the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, you know, being part of a package that is uh, being put forward. It has to still pass the European Parliament and the respective parliaments of the member states. Uh, but it's still, it's out there, and in some forms it's well, I'd say radical, or it will be, um, it will determine a lot of what's going on in the next 20 years when it comes to that. So one of the things uh, the proposal uh, wants to turn into law is actually a quote, new powers to scrutinize how platforms work, including by facilitating access by researchers to key platform data quote end. So this basically equals political leverage, leverage to make platforms share their data, something you know that totally runs against their business model, so to speak. And also on the consumer side, of course, as well, they can check, consumers can check why they're being targeted for certain products and should get the chance to denounce that option actually altogether. So this is just a tiny bit uh, of the many proposals in this Digital Services Act that is being discussed just now. Now, coming from the US and your time at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, you know, one of the best research institutions worldwide, what do you think? chances are this turns into a European USP, so to speak, and an advantage, even for larger tech firms that think, yes, this is a very good way to get more participation, to get more civil society uh, into all those subjects we have been talked about today, or on the contrary, is it going to be a looming disaster because the platforms will probably not cooperate? Where do you stand there? Uh, this is uh, this is predicting. I know this is about the present, but it's about predicting the future. <laughs> and oh, you got me. <laughs> and prediction is really hard, especially about the future. Um, and it's I'm definitely going to be wrong. So that's that's the problem. But let me have a go anyway. Mm -hmm. So in the U.S., there's very strong aversion to regulation of technology because it's seen as something that stifles innovation and you know increases uh, compliance costs on companies and so on. You know, there's a lot of, even then, there's a lot of uh, scrutiny happening, you know, with, with big tech firms like Facebook who are being called to testify in front of Congress and so on to explain. But it's, there's really surprisingly very little discussion of what mechanisms can we actually use to enforce. You know, there's always a discussion, but then what, do, what follows from this? And there's like very few examples some of the platforms do their own research, so they have their own scientists um, doing, um, you know, investigating some of these questions. But they have veto power over, you know, the companies have veto power mm -hmm. over what gets published. So mm -hmm. if something could be damaging to their reputation and or their market share value, then uh, it would not be published. So you need third party. And I know people who have worked on projects with some of these tech firms so external researchers who collaborated and worked for something on something for two years, and then they just were told you couldn't publish this. So it's voluntary in the case of the U.S. And there's one one example, uh, Social Science One, which is a collaboration between Facebook and like a group of academics uh, run by Gary King at Harvard, which is you know uh, allows access to anonymized data from Facebook 
by researchers, but you have to apply, and there's this kind of independent panel, uh, but it's a voluntary participation by Facebook, which is, you know, they, they, have, they are to be commended for doing that. I think the, the European approach is to kind of require this, so that it's one, one rule that applies to all tech firms. It will have a regulatory cost. I mean, it's a compliance cost. There's no question about it. It makes things more complicated. You know, if you could just, as the Silicon Valley motto, move fast and break things, you could move fast. Well, it'll be easier for you and your field of research, but right? But I, for me, it sounds like a good thing because because if if there is a mandate that allows me to go and say, look, here's a, an important question, and by law you have to let me investigate it. That's a very good thing because now we are at the mercy of the of the platforms. And as you mentioned, some people who are studying these these uh, platforms from the outside, they almost have to hack into them. You know, for example, create fake accounts to see if, like, I have a colleague, um, uh, Alan Mislov, who's uh, doing research by creating personas, mm -hmm. and then you know you query the search engine or or uh, like uh, Amazon from different personas because he's trying to see if Amazon will do price discrimination like will it or will it give different results you know in kind of unfair pricing uh, practices but the problem is that by doing this he's violating the terms of service which under some interpretation of the law could be considered as hacking which so he could be prosecuted mm -hmm. so he's suing Facebook or sorry not Facebook I think uh, the, he's suing the federal government to clarify the intent of the law in order not to be sued by the government for, for being a hacker. And there's a lot of you know, unclarity there. So, I, so you can imagine that a researcher would be terrified. You know, like, I'm just trying to write a paper or, mm. and, and answer a scientific question. I could end up in jail. Um, so it would be good to have a legal mandate uh, that regulates this transaction. And of course, you know, the platforms have understandable reasons to be worried. You don't want just any scientist to, you know, there's also bad science, you know, like sure. uh, pe people who want to, sh to sh find something fishy, you know, and maybe do, uh, you know, the methods are not so good and so on. So you want to have, do this in a, in a proper manner uh, in the interest, and I th but I think in the long run, my prediction is that in the long run, this will cause less social problems. So I think it depends, I think in the short term, it's going to be a cost. I think in the long in the long term, I would bet on the European approach, because I think a completely unregulated approach to these things is could have some serious social unrest consequences. Mm -hmm. In Europe, you probably wouldn't be thrown in jail right away, but you may get your funding cut, right? That's what some of the platforms tried to do, actually, in the case of the Swedish young researchers uh, um, who wanted to work with Spotify. Um, so, could we say that, as a very last thought of this evening, that the European wish or fantasy or, or way to regulate more could also be a way of establishing more trust in those machines when the public sees that there is cooperation, whether this cooperation is forced or not, might not be the main point in the end, but you think that could be one outcome of this, that more trust in machines uh, could be established along these lines? I think so, yeah. I think if, look, if we, if scientists could say, for example, with certainty, that bots don't influence elections, for example, right? A lot of people will relax, right? Will say, okay, this thing maybe is overblown. Or if they could establish with, without, with, uh, without uncertainty, you know, or with, with a great degree of certainty that bots do influence elections, then we could do something about it, right? So one way or another, you want to know. Um, now, where, what are the goals? You know, how far do you want to go? Um, what are the red lines that, you know, obviously platforms need to cater to their clients and there are, Everybody has an opinion about what's most important. You know, I want more diversity in my news, but somebody else doesn't want more diversity. They want more personalization. And there has to be a lot of room for personal choice and personal responsibility. You know, we're also responsible human beings, right? We, we, we have to take some responsibility for this, not blame everything on, on the algorithms. But 
there will be sensitive situations, you know, sensitive domains where we need to know what's happening. We need to know if the companies are going too far, if they have too much power. I mean, today we don't know what impact do these algorithms have on children, developmental outcomes, or social behavior, and so on. You know, this is some research, but it's still a very much an open question. Which of these things are, we just need to wait and learn, which ones are too dangerous and we need to, to limit in some way? That's a politi political question, but we can't even explore it until we establish some facts. Thank you so much. Talking about trust, uh, I was worrying when I saw your presentation uh, and, and, uh, and the PowerPoint presentation that you were going to run way too long. You were under the, your estimated time, actually very punctual, and uh, I went a little overboard now uh, in this discussion. But it was so interesting to listen to your talk and to have this conversation with you uh, and the public at home. So thank you very much, Iyad Rawan, for having been with us. Thank you so much for hosting me. Yeah,